Welcome to Wesley Impact. I'm Keith Garner. What do you think it means to live a life of influence? Thank you for joining us. At Wesley Mission, we're privileged to have connection points with people from a wide range of sectors in our communities, ranging from prime ministers, state premiers, and others involved in public service, and also with people who work tirelessly in their local churches and community groups to do all the good they can, and also with the poor and the marginalised. Wherever the connection points happen to be, we all have the ability to influence those around us. Today, I'll be speaking with someone who's held high office in the state of New South Wales and used her influence in a way that makes a very positive impact for future generations. We'll be joined by international opera singer Sarah Toth, who will sing Rejoice, the Lord is King. And I'll bring some focus on Luke 10, which speaks of how Jesus sent disciples out two by two. And then in this account in Luke, we see how these groups came back and what they had to say. Jesus' main concern is not a spotlight on what they'd achieved, but upon the most important aspect of belonging to him. Here at Wesley Mission, we don't hide the fact that we ask for your help to enable us to do all the good we can. We're aware that different people contribute to our work in different ways. For some, it may be financial support. For others, it might be time. And for others still, it might be in your prayers. Every winter, we run an appeal designed to raise support for all that we do. Finances are an important part of our work, but that's not all that we're about. Our annual winter appeal is also designed to promote our work and give people who might want to join us or volunteer their time to be aware of the opportunities we can provide. Another important part is transparency. And to that end, we regularly produce reports to help people to be aware of the real needs of the folk in our modern Australia. Of course, the winter's here in Australia, but in the rest of the world, it's warming up. But we need your help to help reach out to those in need. Before I became homeless, um, I, was, I was married. I had a pretty normal life. Um, I had a good job, um, lived in a nice home. I have a degree in marketing. I used to work three jobs to put myself through university. Um, I've always worked quite hard and I've always been employed. With my husband, the relationship just, we just weren't communicating. Um, it had broken down to the point where it was just difficult living in the home with him. I didn't want to leave my family home. I didn't want Caitlin to leave the home that she'd grown up in. But that's the only choice I had. I decided to go and live with my father because he had two months left to live. And um, yeah, I just wanted to spend some time with family and be with him and help him. I had to leave my job to be able to go and care for him. And I was scared because I was losing everything that I had. I was scared because I didn't know what the future would hold once my father had passed away. Well, after dad died, I was actually diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Um, and the only place I had to go was to live with a friend. So Caitlin and I moved there for a little while, but that became too difficult um, because I thought that I'd be able to get a job because I'd always been employed, never had a problem with work, but I wasn't able to get a job. And the longer we stayed there, uh, the more difficult that situation became as well because my friend just, she didn't want us there. She was becoming aggressive with Caitlin. Um, so we had to leave and the only place I had to go was to live in the car. We lived um, by a beach and because we didn't have an address, I had to homeschool Caitlin from the car. We'd eat in there and sleep in there and we'd have to have showers in the public bathrooms at the beach. Um, we'd, we'd have to do it early in the morning before anybody turned up because I didn't want anybody to realise that we were living out of our car. I would brush our teeth in there, we'd use the bathroom in there, but it was just, 
it was degrading having to do that and try to make it normal for Caitlin. I went to the authorities and I told them that we were homeless, but I was told that there would be an eight week wait. I'd have to be homeless for eight weeks before they could help me to find a home. The eight weeks were um, the hardest days of my life because I was dealing with my cancer and I was dealing with the grief, the loss of my home, loss of my job. My father had passed away and I was dealing with all this from the back of my car. I felt really alone. After eight weeks, the authorities referred me to a lady called Grace at Wesley Mission and that's when things improved for me, almost immediately. Grace was like a godsend. She saw how dire my situation was. She was the only person who listened to me. She's the only person who took my situation seriously. And so she found Caitlin and I housing. She put a roof over her head. And then I could send Caitlin to school again because I had an address. And it brought safety back into our lives because we had somewhere to live and somewhere to pull home. Caitlin and I are so happy now that we're in our own home and she's thriving at school. She's really happy and she's made friends. I still haven't found a full-time job, but I'm not giving up hope on that. I um, started to work for a local cafe, doing some marketing work for them, and life's really good. It's normal again. Over 44% of households suffer from financial stress. Of those, 28% develop a diagnosed mental illness and 10% experience domestic violence. Avoiding your finances makes it even worse. So Wesley Mission offers much needed support to help families face their financial future stress-free. Donate today to help families face their future stress-free. What an amazing story, quite confronting in many ways. If you want to support our work or to find out more about our special winter appeal, please visit our website and follow the links. The address is wesleymission.org.au. Now, earlier this year, Wesley Mission was joined at a public event by the second longest serving and the first, and to date, the only female governor of New South Wales, Dame Mary Bashir. During the event, I spoke with the former governor, and over the next two weeks, I'd like you to invite you to, to listen in on the conversation that she shares about her public and personal life. Former and second longest uh, serving governor of New South Wales, just short of Sir Roden Cutler, yeah. is his record. I'm proud to say 10 years ago, you, you, you spoke at my induction here at Wesley Mission, and so we're, we're always delighted to have you here. Yeah. Born in Narandra, tell us a little bit about those early days because it's a very different place than Sydney and the, the, the part of life that you've shared over these past years. Yes, well my mother was a Sydney girl from a, a well-established family. Uh, she fell in love with um, a medical student who came from Beirut whose father and uncle were both graduates of the American University there. They'd been formed by um, descendants of the Scottish Enlightenment. Father came on a visit to Sydney on the boat. Uh, there were a young couple coming back to Australia from their honeymoon. They were shocked to hear he didn't know anyone in Australia. You know, he was shy but adventurous. So they introduced him to their family and he immediately fell in love with Victoria, the comely, gentle, talented, person that he married and he stayed in Australia, established a retail business. Sometimes when, when you have a guess, you look at their achievements. I didn't have enough paper here really, you know, to, oh. to be able to list, to list all the achievements and awards that, that have been given to you. But I think it would have been special, having been at the University of Sydney, to be Chancellor at the University. Oh, well, I never entertained such ambitions. In fact, the only ambition I ever had, and you can understand this growing up in an idyllic town such as Narandra, was to go on living in the glorious region of the Riverina, marry a farmer and have lots of children. <laughs> Look what happened to me. <laughs> 
and and all of that uh, uh, is very very different. It, it changed. You 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 married somebody who, in his own right, uh, has much. He was of course Lord Mayor in this city and uh, involved in in that room, but also in sport too. And I I suspect though I, I wouldn't presume this that there'll be times when the two of you are there when. When one of the men wants to take your husband in the corner and have a chat about rugby, never mind what else is oh. going on. <laughs> that that remains to this day after <laughs> fifty-seven years of marriage. <laughs> <laughs> the Christian faith was very much part of your f family life, and I know that when we talked together, you, 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 it was natural. It wasn't something that was forced upon you. It was no. a, a natural atmosphere at home. Well, that's right, indeed. My mother often used to just in, in her admonishments to us, and she was witty and fun, she'd say, go to the ant thou slug and learn his ways and be wise. You know, she could always <laughs> quote something, honour thy father and thy mother so thy days, you know. we say, oh, mum. <laughs> Prior to becoming the, the Governor of New South Wales, you had that important position as Clinical Director of Mental Health Services mm. uh, in, in the central Sydney area. Mental health has been a, a major uh, focus of your medical uh, career. Um, and you, it was in very changing times. We went through the Richmond Report, we went through mm. changes. Uh, how, how, how would you see that, that mm. arena now in the light of your own work? Well, I was very privileged to be able to move into mental health because I did so as a form of protest. I was appalled and, and hurt by the way uh, mentally ill people uh, were not being properly understood. They were being given medication and so forth and ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, but it wasn't so frequently that they were asked where did your distress, where did your depression begin? How did it start? Did anything go wrong in your childhood? And I realised much later after I'd moved into psychiatry that probably going into that area, which, of which I had no intention in the beginning, was probably overdetermined by one of my beloved first cousins who'd gone from one of Australia's finest and oldest boarding schools to the jungles of Bougainville in the Japanese War, you know, from the King's School to the jungles and uh, had been awarded a military medal for bravery and on return to Australia uh, had endless treatment for depression including ECT and it was only in recent years when I was able to quietly ask at the Australian War Museum, could I see the record that I understood why. That becoming a hero, in inverted commas, had been a cost to his mm -hmm. sense of uh, respect for human life in saving his battalion. Uh, he'd had to inflict, uh, yeah, death on the Japanese and uh, he was never able to live with that. So the depression and the inability to ever adequately readjust, certainly he went back to work, he was a writer, a journalist, etc. But a sensitive and wonderful human being who couldn't love, live with uh, what mm. he'd been mm. compelled to do in order to save his men. Mm. And almost everything that we do at Wesley Mission in one way or another is impacted by the mental health issue. Now we'll have a second part of that conversation next week and much more an insight into the personal faith that maintains this wonderful woman and all that she is. I do hope you'll join us for that. Join me now in welcoming Sarah Toff. Sarah is the daughter of Methodist missionary parents and spent much of her youth in Hungary. Upon returning to the United States of America and studying at Greenville College, Sarah discovered a passion for opera and has gone on in the world stage performing in many international productions, including La Boheme, Figaro, Don Giovanni and Mendelssohn's Elijah. Sarah joins us now to sing Rejoice, the Lord is King.
It's been 200 years since the first Methodists met in Australia. To celebrate two centuries of faith and pioneering care, CEO and presenter Reverend Dr Keith Garner takes us back to where it all began. But we don't begin here at the heart of London. We begin in a town in the north of England. In this fascinating narrative, Reverend Garner chronicles the history of the life and times of the founder of Methodism, John Wesley. This fresh and thought-provoking documentary takes us on a journey throughout the United Kingdom, beginning in John Wesley's hometown of Epworth. John Wesley was born here on the 17th of June, 1703. This one-hour DVD travels on to his education years and beginnings of social justice in Oxford, to his final years in London. For more information on John Wesley, the man and his mission, call 02 9263 5555 or email us at impacttv at au. And Sarah Toss, beautiful voice, singing the words of Charles Wesley, uh, John's brother. Uh, and so I hope you'll get a chance to see that DVD. I want to turn, if I can, um, in this show to an account in Luke 10. It's only found in Luke, so as we journey through Luke, this is one of those uh, particular passages to Luke. Matthew and Mark tell the story of 12 being sent out, and although there are similarities, there are some very striking differences. 70 are sent out. That tells me that, that already in these early days of the ministry of Jesus, there is really gathering around him a growing number of, of people who are followers, although not part of the inner circle of disciples. There's 120 by the time we reach uh, Acts chapter 2. So 70 are sent out. Why 70? Well, Moses in the Old Testament, you read Numbers uh, chapter 11, selected 70 elders to help him. Seven, 70, they're all special kinds of numbers. And it shows that Jesus was relating to a wider group than merely the 12. And the practical nature of Jesus sending out the disciples two by two is worth noting. So I'm going to read, if I can, to you from that particular chapter, verses 17 through to 20. Here is what we read. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now, these 70 or 72, these disciples know what it is to return after they've been sent out on this particular mission. Now, I don't know about you. This is how I think we Aussies would say about them when they come back. They're all pumped up. <laughs> they've been excited at what they've been involved in. They've really got themselves on the edge. They feel that what they've experienced is unique. It would certainly be unique to their life then for Jesus to send them out and then for them to return back and tell a, an account, a story of what things were like. Uh, that they, they would feel that they were full of their own achievements, things that had happened. Perhaps they, they exaggerate just a little bit. They see this star falling. They, they, they talk in very grandiose terms about that experience. But it clearly was uh, something that made an indelible mark upon their lives. They felt the privilege, the privilege that may, lent them to a, a, perhaps an exaggeration of emotion. But when they come back, they've got much to say about what has happened on that journey. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you know, it's a marvellous picture um, that, 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 that is there, that, that, that Jesus uh, recognises uh, what has happened in them. Now, these disciples have this experience, these, these 70 or 72 people have this experience of what has happened to them. But Jesus reminds them what their real priority ought to be. And so we read in verse 20, however, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now, I think that's worth unpacking, making sense of in some way. Don't rejoice in, in, in merely something that you've achieved or something you feel that God has graciously done through you, but rejoice in the fact that you belong to him. Rejoice that you're his. 
Now, I think that's a very, very important thing. It's important for those of us involved in ministry and in Christian leadership. We can easily talk and brag about the, the great things, all these things that we've achieved in our lives. And the one thing that matters more than anything else is that we belong to him that our names are written in the book of life, that we, we, we know what it is, that we are identified with Jesus Christ. And I think that what Jesus is saying to these disciples is, don't get yourself on a, too much of a high. Don't get ahead of yourself. Don't be full of yourself. Um, we need to be a people ready to be able to declare what's true. But you know, that you belong to me is what matters most of all. And I think that that, that really is, has a contemporary ring about it. It has something that reminds us all. And in this journey to the cross, it's going to be important to the followers of Jesus that they keep things in real perspective. You know, I once remember going to, to, to Texas. It's way back in, in the late 70s when I was beginning my ministry. And when I went there, I remember going to Galveston Island, having a photograph taken. And I remember showing it to people, to England, where I was living at the time. And I said, that's a picture of me at Galveston. Oh, and that's the Pacific Ocean behind me. And then I thought afterwards, gosh, I just did, got that out of perspective, didn't I? There's me with the privilege of standing before the Pacific Ocean. Keep things in perspective. And Jesus reminds those disciples that all of us are to rejoice, not just in what we do, not just in what we achieve, but to rejoice that we are actually God's. If you would like to contact Keith and find out more about today's program, write to us at Wesley Mission, Post Office Box A5555, Sydney South 1235, or you can send an email to impacttv at wesleymission.org.au. On our website, you can catch up on past episodes of Wesley Impact, find out more about our work, read online magazines and articles, and connect with us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter and YouTube. You can also connect to Keith's blog and stay up to date on all of the latest news and information from Wesley Mission. wesleymission.org.au Just a reminder that you're welcome to contact me anytime and ask anything about this program and the Christian faith. I can be contacted on Impact TV at wesleymission.org.au or via the website. Details are there for you. I always enjoy hearing people's thoughts about the program, ways we might improve it, people we might talk to, and replying to your comments and questions. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Dame Mary Bashir, wonderful woman, and also Sarah Toff. And I'd like to invite you again to tune in next week for the second part of that interview with Dame Mary Bashir. I hope you found yourself stimulated by looking at the way Jesus responded to those who returned at the time of their mission. Thank you again for joining us. Always good to share with you in, in your life. So thank you for joining us and God bless you. Wesley Mission helps more than 2,400 people each year through Wesley Homeless Services. To find out more, visit wesleymission.org.au.